This video is brought to you by Squarespace. My fellow Aussians, what's going on? It's your old pal, Yellow Brick Dan. I'm excited to get into some Wizard of Oz lore. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. By the way, I can't even begin to tell you how tickled I am that they had a Yellow Brick Road costume. I immediately had to get it because it sets up the perfect dad joke. You ready for this? You ready for this? Follow me on this incredible journey of wicked witch costume history. Follow the yellow brick Dan, follow the yellow brick Dan, follow, 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 follow the yellow brick Dan. Should I have it like up like this? Now I just feel like a like a floppy piece of cheese. I think my head's gotta come out and I gotta like wear it like, uh, like, uh, like a vampire cape. <laughs> The original Wizard of Oz book written in 1900 by L. Frank Baum presents us with a very different Wicked Witch of the West than we're all hyper fixated on today. She isn't green in the books and her color isn't even directly mentioned except for the fact that she said to melt like brown sugar, you know, when she finally kicks the bucket. Uh, I don't know. She's got one evil telescopic eye like Mad-Eye Moody. This is a very different Wicked Witch. She appears late in the story, like the 12th chapter after she's melted she is not really mentioned again or spoken on in the subsequent 13 more books about the land of oz that l frank Baum writes but yet here we are an entire fantasy empire built on the back of one major villain that's barely a whisper in the extended canon of her universe Shortly after the book was written, L. Frank Baum also adapted his own story into a Broadway musical. Woo, 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 this is, I hope everyone's, are you sitting down? I hope you're sitting down. This show infamously borrowed heavily from the very controversial like uh, minstrel scene at the time and starred a very popular pair of blackface performers as the Tin Man and Scarecrow combo, which gives me ick in a serious way, especially considering how much Frank Elbaum loved, loved it. He loved them so much. He loved their performance so much, specifically the Scarecrow, that it went on to influence like how the Scarecrow was presented like from then on. So, uh, yikes. Um, there's no Wicked Witch in the play. Uh, she's completely written out, uh, replaced by like this crazy old hag, uh, character lady named Cynthia, who's accused of being a witch. She's not a witch. And then she sings a horribly inappropriate song called The Witch Behind the Moon, which is essentially like the Wizard of Oz song of the South. This is all yikes, guys. This is yikes. Apparently Bob wasn't a great guy. I'm learning that. I'm learning that the more I research about this uh, and the show itself also not great. It's a political drama that just doesn't like, it just doesn't like hit. Baum himself would go on to produce various versions of this play and musical, including like ra radio and like, I, I don't even like film for like art film houses. And it, it made him go bankrupt. He went bankrupt, but Hey, it was, it was big, man. It was a, it was a Broadway musical from 1902. You know, that's very problematic. Now I brought up the musical because it heavily, heavily influenced like everything moving forward, everything, including the first silent film, the 1910 Wizard of Oz silent film, unauthorized, uh, well, like not directly sanctioned by Bob. So like th th there's some, it, there's some weirdness in this one. Like there's no, to there's no Toto. It's like a, it's like a donkey or something, I don't know. But it's the first time we see the iconic villain of Oz on film. This uh, is wild because it's not the Wicked Witch. Again, because it was like this unauthorized thing, it's Mamba the Witch, woo. Uh, and uh, you know, playing fast and loose with that copyright or whatever, I don't know. <laughs> she has the short scene in the woods where she like comes out of the hut and she's floating and she's got the broom and the pointy hat witch's nose, it's iconic. Then, the, then they go to the castle and there's a second scene. Pretty cool, especially considering the movie's only 13 minutes long and it's got like banger special effects. Like when the witch melts at the end, whoa, check out that. <laughs> Yikes, man, yikes. Cool, cool, cool. Gotta love old movies, man. Now here's where we get to it. Here's where we get to it. The 1939 legendary picture that is The Wizard of Oz, presented in beautiful Technicolor. 
<laughs> and it's almost entirely a result of Bomb bankrupting himself with all of these like plays and productions. So he had to sell the rights to MGM to like make the movie. And man, they went hard with that Technicolor. Why don't we paint the witch bright green? Cause that'll look really good on Technicolor. And that's it, that's it. That's the reason why she's green. She's green because it would just, it was, it just looked cooler. I'll get you my pretty and your little dog too. <laughs> so they just covered Margaret Hamilton with this copper based paint for a purely visual gag Adrian Adolph Greenberg, he, but he just went as Adrian in the business, the costume designer. Adrian, like, put this whole look together. <laughs> oh my goodness, what an incredible witch. Who designed that? Adrian. <laughs> this man in 1939. Yes, I am Adrian. <laughs> anyway, they're right. They were right. They were right. It looks so much cooler. And everyone agreed almost universally overnight, witches went from being like this, like, uh, like yellowy orange kind of thing, like in Halloween decorations to like everything was a green witch. Green witches, green witches, green witches. And you you know it growing up, you were, you were affected by this. Every witch that you remember growing up being like a green faced witch with a black outfit is because of this movie. It's because of how freaking iconic this movie was. And what's wild is she barely has like 12 minutes of screen time in the entire thing. But MGM was able to copyright this very specific green, a very specific silhouette, like the, the shoulders and, and the hat and the point and the roundness, all of it, broom, all of it. They were able to like really lock down a copyright because this was their version of the witch. Remember, no green witch in the book. She's not green. So MGM made all that happen. This MGM copyright would go on to influence every single version of the Wicked Witch to ever appear moving forward as brands try to emulate the iconicness of Margaret Hamilton in this role, but are terrified of being sued. So this is just this is just gonna be a fun rabbit hole to go down because it's like that tiptoe, it's says like that legal tiptoeing. <laughs> Now here's an interesting turn I wasn't expecting, but in 1970, local steam train entrepreneurs uh, picked up a ski resort in North Carolina, the Beach Mountain Ski Resort, with the intentions of flipping it into like a year round family fun activity. And what they chose was the Wizard of Oz and they licensed it. They fully licensed it for the Land of Oz. And uh, wow, a fully interactable retelling of Dorothy's journey, complete with a converted ski lift that was made into a hot air balloon ride. The park had multiples of each character, like just strewn around the park so that you could like always be inter interacting with and encountering Dorothy in the Tin Man. There were four different witches on property. Uh, unfortunately, like a fire in 1975 caused it to like close down. Um, but wow, to think of how wild a tourist trap this must have been back in the day. Um, the witch appearance here, much like the rest of the characters, are just heavily influenced on the film. This was a licensed film kind of thing. And so, you know, they, they, they got that whole look kind of like on lock. And what's cool is someone bought the place and is restoring it. You know, like you're seeing like with the, you're seeing a lot of more restored footage than anything because they're kind of like reopening the park slowly. It's like, you can go back, you can do it. It's in partial operation. So go there and spend your money if you want more Oz things. Okay, now let's talk The Wiz. The Wiz. The amazing seven time Tony award winning The Wiz. Completely different spin on the Wizard of Oz lore. And so there is no Wicked Witch of the West, but there is an Eveline um, with a set of completely over the top costumes to help really amplify like just her sinister vibes. It's just so cool. I love the movie costume. I love it. I love it so much. Um, both performances, Broadway and movie, they kind of like both happen like back to back, both performed by Mabel King. Cause she's just iconic. She's just a legend. She's just a legend. And I, I just had to talk about this show, despite the fact that it's not like a green wicked witch, the show just eats, it eats. It eats, as the kids say. I love the Wiz. Ease on down, baby. And by the way, three-time Tony nominee, Tony Waltron got a Tony nomination for doing this show. So there you go. 
And I also just wanted to see how many times I could say Tony in one sentence. In 1976, some like 35 plus years since the original film, Margaret Hamilton had like a renaissance. She had like this, <laughs> what only could be described, described as like a guest appearance spree. She just went hard and heavy. I don't know why. Maybe someone could share it with me. I think I have a theory and I'll get on that in a second, but um, she was like, she just got caught up in doing lots of guest appearances. And the most infamous one is the Sesame Street appearance. Only recently was this episode unearthed and shared with the world. And for good reason, this was like a lost Sesame Street episode for a while because kids were terrified of it. And I just watched it and I agree, lock this episode back up. It completely breaks the rules of Sesame Street, man. All right, this episode is crazy. The Wicked Witch accidentally crash lands in Sesame Street and she begins to wreak havoc, like almost instantly, cursing people with her magic aggressively, like Cruciato cursing people and like conjuring feather dusters out of thin air to like threaten Big Bird. It's, 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 it's something, man. It's a, it's an episode. And it just like breaks everything about what Sesame Street was. This like realistic rounded place that kids like could like see and experience uh, like, you know, grounded learning lessons about sharing and numbers in the alphabet. And now there's a witch and she's using magic to make people feel pain. Terrified, terrified. In addition to that iconic lost Sesame Street appearance, Margaret Hamilton also popped in a lot of other places as the Wicked Witch. My favorite was Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Margaret Hamilton strolled on down, rang his doorbell. He's like, come on in. She brought a big old bag. And that bag has her costume in it, her movie costume that still fits crazy enough. I don't know. I don't know, that's neat. That's kind of cool. It, it's again, like I mentioned, 35 years later, but uh, she demonstrates putting the costume on, which is kind of cool. Seeing all the different pieces from the cape to the skirt to the shirt. Uh, and also it's kind of hilarious the two of them interacting with each other as she's getting dressed, it's weird. Mr. Rogers watching a woman get dressed is weird energy. <laughs> I don't know, I can't put my finger on it, but I like it. And it's also a fun conversation. She's like, she talks about like the witch and like how she like explored the characterization in the movie and it's, it's fun, it's fun. Listening to her like uh, try to gaslight herself into thinking that the witch has like good intentions and maybe had like a good history and wasn't all wicked. I'm certain, I'm beyond certain had to have influenced like what ended up happening with this character, obviously spoilers, foreshadowing. You know what's coming, you know what's coming. And I just think that uh, sometimes we think she's just mean and a, a very bad person, but actually you have to think about uh, her point of view that it wasn't as, as happy a time as she wanted it to be because she just never got what she wanted. Also, she appeared on the Paul Lynn show. You remember Paul Lynn, Center Square? If you don't, you're missing out. But if, if you know, you know. Uh, when is it a good idea to put your pantyhose in the microwave oven for about two minutes? <laughs> when your house is surrounded by the police. <laughs> And uh, she was on a Paul Lind Halloween special with Kiss. So if you didn't know that there was a Wicked Witch Kiss crossover, now you know, now you know. And I think that all of this happened as a result of her appearance at the St. Louis Muni Opera House, the uh, iconic Muni. It's still like, it's a huge thing. Everyone's still doing the Muni. I would love to do the Muni. Muni, give me a call. I'll come do, let me come do some of your bits and, and, and uh, you know, I'll dance and sing. I, I got that. I could do that. So it was really her year, I guess, you know, like it was just the year of Margaret Hamilton and she was everywhere, but it really helped me understand her a lot more as a character performer. And I got, I, I gotta say, I, hats off and she she worked this role for decades making that bank work it margaret <laughs> now arguably what i think is one of the luckiest breaks disney parks ever got 
and, and, uh, and Michael Eisner, for that matter, was their partnership with MGM for the 1989 MGM Studios theme park because MGM was the license holder for uh, the Hamilton Witch, the Wizard of Oz characters, like all of that iconic stuff. I, I mean, of course, of course, you're going to plaster that all over a brand new ride that you're going to build. You're going to make the Wizard of Oz like front and center. And they did. They did. They essentially did. And also they had like one heck of a special animatronic with the Wicked Witch. It looks so good. It looks so good. This was the first A100 audio animatronic and it introduced fluid motion for these robots and it was an absolute game changer. Uh, realistic gestures and like expressions. She could like, like, you know, move and wiggle in ways that Abraham Lincoln could never, could never. And it really marked this major leap for Disney as uh, an animatronic developer. Uh, the, the lifelike like head tilts and like the point and the engaging, like I'll get to my pretty scowl. Like it was cool, it was cool. And fun fact, we were supposed to have a whole like tornado segment with the witch in the original ride. But uh, MGM's like, look, you, go, you, go, you only get two scenes. You only get two Wizard of Oz scenes, pick them. And so, but the, but the tornado was already like half built. So they, they just turned into like a Fantasia, like a Fantasia water scene. You know that I'm talking about now that you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, that was oddly tornado shaped. But now that it's Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, it's back to a tornado to like, as an homage, if you will. I love this robot, man. It was so cool. This scene, this scene, why isn't this scene not like, why wasn't it not moved to the Smithsonian? Like intact, operating. Like what? Like what? Like what? Like what? You know? People, people say, and I have to agree that this Wicked Witch like turned into like a Kylo Ren or something. What are your theories about what the Wicked Witch animatronic ultimately was turned into when they got this ride? Let me know in the comments. In 1995, Gregory Maguire, author extraordinaire, revisited the land of Oz with his own spin on things, his own, his own twist on the Wicked Witch lore in his fantasy revisionist novel, Wicked, and the world was never the same. Wow, this book is wild. I read it, I read it, did you, have you read it? Who hasn't read it, right? A gripping thriller, it's like a, 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 it's like a ex explorative, thing that humanizes the witch that he named Elphaba after L. Frank Baum, Elphaba, right? We get it, we get it. Clever, Greg. We, it tracks this woman who is a socially ostracized character. It's really tragic and eventually becomes like a radicalized terrorist. And um, it's a real, it's a real wild story. But it's interesting because McGuire at the time, like in the early nineties, he was kind of confronted with a lot of like news media stories about some really tragic stuff that had happened in the world. Lots of like trials and, and like some pretty crazy people. And yet like he understood that these these people were sometimes victims themselves of tragic crimes that kind of led them down the path of becoming a villain. And he was kind of obsessed with that, you know, and I I'm right there with you, Greg. That's a fascinating thing to talk about. Are people born wicked or do they have wickedness thrust upon them? Fun fact that you might not know about this book. They turned it into a musical. Oh, you did know? You heard? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm obsessed with this musical. And the show is full of tons of great costumes. Alphaba, the character and its adaptations, they, they did great. There's like schoolgirl Alphaba. There's like, you know, like bedroom Alphaba. There's all these different Alphabas, but let's just talk about big girl, wicked witch Alphaba costume because that look is just top notch. That's what this is all about. That's what we came here for. We came here for the pointy hat look, you know? Now they did a lot of creative twists here to avoid copyright infringement. So let's kind of break down the clever ways that they reinvented the costume. The biggest and most obvious thing is that the costume isn't black. It's actually purple, a really, really deep earthy purple tone that gives it the illusion of black when it's properly lit and it's in the right kind of scene work, you know, up on stage. It's this Victorian Edwardian kind of upgrade to the standard black robes that Margaret Hamilton wore in the 1939 film. And it really transforms the storytelling of the character. Elphaba herself is very much in touch with like nature and like how the world of Oz works. And her costume needs to like reflect that. It's meant to give this very organic feel. Like it was almost grown from the earth itself. 
check out the hat though. Let's talk about the hat because this is one of the coolest parts of the costume. It's very unique. The brim of the hat goes up on the side. Now that's for two reasons. One, of course, to make it different than the MGM copyright, but two, to allow the face of the character to be lit. It allows the lighting designers like some room to play instead of having a giant baseball hat, you know, that you're like wearing to block all your lights. Why Kenny won't let me wear baseball hats when I'm making these videos? Cause otherwise my face would be half shaded. So that's why I gotta go to the barber and get haircuts every time I film or most of the time. You can, I'm sure you guys can tell when I haven't been to the barber to film a quick episode or so. <laughs> Anyway, also pick up on the hat. The front brim is much shorter than the rest of the hat all the way around. And that's actually for the sound designers to prevent the performer echoing as the voice rockets up and bounces off the brim of the hat where the microphone is situated. That shorter piece allows everything to kind of be, you know, copacetic. You know what I mean? Everything sounds mwah, perfect. It's such an iconic one of a kind character design and um, hats off to all of it. It's just so much depth. Uh, and and I am, uh, I'm, I'm obsessed with like just the, the raw ripped tattered fabric. It really makes her look like the outsider compared to all of the high couture fashion in the rest of the show. Uh, I mean, Elphaba is a very, very, very different creature. Love it. Give me 20 more years of this musical, please. I've seen it plenty. I've seen it plenty. And it's, 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 uh, I got the, Got my souvenir program. Would you like to know who my Alphaba and uh, Glinda were when I saw Jennifer Laura Thomas and Shoshana Bean? My girl Shoshana Bean continues to live in my heart uh, as my favorite Alphaba ever. Shout out to Shoshana. Uh, also the greatest, um, what's her face in, in Waitress? Uh, this, isn't, this isn't a Dan Does Broadway talk. Hallelujah. But still, we we had to, we had to, we had to, we had to touch on Wicked. All right, of course, of course, I have to mention one of my favorite versions of Oz, Muppet Oz, the 2005 Muppets Wizard of Oz. Uh, there is no traditional green Wicked Witch in this film. Is anyone picking up on why? Does anyone any keen Muppet fans you know, uh, paying attention and 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 figuring it out? Here's why. The Muppets are really good at accurately adapting literature. And the original book doesn't have a green witch, just has like a mean old witch with an eye patch and a telescopic eye. There you go, there you go. And Miss Piggy has a monkey, doesn't fly, but she's got a monkey and a suave Italian Muppet friend. Any, any Johnny Fiamma fans out there? Leave a comment, hashtag Johnny Fiamma. Um, I love this movie. I love it. I love it so much. I wish that just a few more of the beats just worked better because the character design, the the like the integrity of the story, it actually holds up really well, like really, really well. Let's talk about the 2013, the great and powerful Oz or Oz the great and powerful. I don't know. I, okay, whatever. Dis, whatever Disney's attempt in 2013 to like do their own Oz, you know, why not? We got James Franco on contract. This is all yikes, guys. This is yikes. Freaking James Franco, man. It's a prequel series, uh, much like Wicked. It wanted to be Wicked. It was like a proto Disney Wicked, but it turned into like a, again, another like weird political thriller, you know, with a fantasy setting and power grabs and like backstabs and betrayals and wicked transformations. It's bananas that the girl from the 70s show who voices Meg on Family Guy is the Wicked Witch in this movie. And again, to sidestep all the copyright issues of the MGM Witch, uh, this costume and look is mega different. What's on, what, 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 what are on the shoulders? And she's got a head wrap, which is cool, actually. The original design for the Wicked Witch of the West in the 1939 film was gonna be this more haute couture, like glamour witch with like a, with a beautiful like head wrap scarf thing like this. Didn't work, doesn't work. It's the reason why they didn't do it. The reason why they didn't do it this is a disaster. It's just a disaster. And like, what's with all the leather? Like, what is this, Catwoman Alphaba? Leather, leather Faba? But also she's just, she, isn't she questionable now? People don't like her now. This is yikes. Clowns be clowning. Speaking of clowns be clowning, 2013 also gave us uh, a Wicked Witch integration with ABC's Once. You guys, you guys like ABC's Once? You guys remember Zelina? turned green with envy and jealousy. By the way, also, let's just talk about how funny it is that canonically, all these versions of these stories from Wicked to Oz the Great and Powerful, and even once, have to come up with a reason why their character's green. Like, because she's not green in the, in the original story. 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Wicked had like this incredibly questionable consent thing, like with the, with like the green elixir, read the book, ask your parents, whatever. I don't know. So it's cool. I guess that we have all these reasons why everyone's green. This makeup and costume is something else. Awful. What is the shade of green again? What, why is it metallic and also Gothic wicked, Witch? doesn't do it for me. Um, no girl, I do not want, I do not want this. I do not want, I don't want this. I don't want this. Here's a couple quick honorable mentions of Wicked Witches that otherwise I, I don't need to talk about. So here's maybe like two sentences on them. Uh, Emerald City, the NBC series, it just straight up breaks my brain. Again, an Oz political drama about the witches. I'm exhausted. I'm already exhausted just by the description. And all the witches are like just named after the direction they're from. So there's like East Witch and West and North and they all do different magic. I don't know, I'm not talking about it. The Tin Man sci-fi series. Zoe De Chanel, Alan Cummings, just a whole collection of character actors doing character bits, but no green witch here. Just like a like an ancient evil that possesses people into doing bad things, but not like a green witch. Not not there. You will find a green witch at Legoland though. <laughs> And hey, Agatha all along, episode seven. I love I love witchy Marvel stuff. It's just so much fun. And Agatha gets turned into the Wicked Witch of the West in the in the trial, the tarot trial. That's fine and all, but can we talk about Patty Lapone Galinda? Thank you, MCU, for making some of the greatest television for the gays uh, in the history of the modern era. <laughs> Patty Lapone is Galinda. Are you kidding me? And whoa, looks like we're here at the end of the road with this new modern Wicked movie, 2024 Wicked. There's just Wicked Witch licensed branded stuff everywhere now. Huge wicked merch push. I, you're just, I'm drowning in it everywhere I look. Uh, but the new costumes in the movie are cool because they really honor the original Broadway costumes, but heighten them for like the cinematic on-screen feel. The camera's a lot closer than your eyeballs will ever be in a Broadway theater. And so they had to change a lot of stuff. Can we talk about the crazy figure eight glasses for Elphaba? Whoa, those are cool. What a clever design. Can't wait to see everybody wearing those for the next three years solid. But Elphaba's big girl witch costume, again, the one we're all here for, really is serving. It absolutely is serving. Without Without the stage lighting um, and like the sound problems, the hat is just back to being like a big, cool, round brimmed hat, but they kind of tweak the pointiness of it. And so it's tiered, like kind of like a wobbly wedding cake. I don't know the best way to describe it or something. It's just got that whole like whimsical sort of like, you know, head business and that's cool. And the dress leans heavily into that organic ruffled Victorian feel that the original Broadway production did. The costume is made almost entirely of gorgeous ruffled layers. I think it's really well done. It's nothing but gorgeous ruffled layers. It's just, I, uh, Cynthia Revo is just drowning in gorgeous ruffled layers. And breaking costume news, just as I was putting the finishing touches on this video, a new meet and greet of Elphaba and Galinda debuted at the Wicked pop-up store in Universal Studios Orlando. Kenny was actually down in Florida on a quick vacation and he went to the Wicked store and it's actually kind of cool inside. They have tons of displays of various character costumes worn in the movie. And of course they have tons of Wicked merchandise too. Do you think Ariana Grande farted in that dress. 100%, 100%, right, yeah. But I love seeing all the close-up footage of the hat, as well as the alphabet costumes from the film. You can see loads of details of the fabrics and the materials they used. Uh, this is great, this is perfect. Unfortunately, Universal will not announce scheduled times to meet these characters. So you just have to hope that they're there when you're going. I don't know. It's not like anyone's hyped for this movie or anything, Universal. Cool, real cool, cool move, smooth move. And themed land breaking news, I just learned from you fans as I was posting about making this video that they're building a Wizard of Oz land at Warner Brothers Movie World Australia, complete with a roller coaster and, and all kinds of cool experiences, all set to the 1939 movie. So be sure to expect a catch, a Wicked Witch meet and greet there very soon. 
I'm thinking like very soon. There's no place like a great website building tool. There's no place like a great website building tool. There's no place like a great website building tool. Ah, oh, wow, Squarespace, today's video sponsor, a great website building tool. I gotta say, I, I'm ridiculous with these like sponsor intros, but I have fun doing them, I have fun. Squarespace has done it again. Forget AI and welcome design intelligence, combining two decades of industry leading design expertise with cutting edge AI AI technology to unlock your strongest creative potential. Design intelligence empowers anyone to build a beautiful, more personalized website tailored to their unique needs and craft a bespoke digital identity to use across one's entire online presence. I'd like to imagine what kind of website the Wicked Witch would build. And I think that she would definitely go down like kind of like the mystical aquaphobia support group website, you know, for witches suffering from uh, water sensitivity and uh, allergies and Squarespace's super flexible templates continue to be amazing. Get started with a professionally designed Squarespace website template with options for every use and category, then customize your look, update content, and add features to fit your needs. Transform any template into your own and stand out online on every device, even mobile. They let you edit mobile, it's great. And here's something pretty cool for all your small businesses out there, introducing invoices. An easy way to collect payments so you can focus on growing your business. Invoice clients and get paid for your services, turn leads into client proposals, estimates and contracts, and simplify your workflow and manage your service business on one platform. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Disney Dan to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Well, thanks for watching my extensive history on the Wicked Witch of the West. I had a great time. I have so much respect for Margaret Hamilton. It was a blast. It was a blast. I <laughs> can't believe I'm dressed like the Yellow Brick Road, but, uh, but it worked. It ended up working. I'm, uh, no complaints here. I'm happy with it. I think it really all came together. You know what to do, guys. Make sure you like this video, leave a comment, make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. And uh, of course, visit me across all the holy social medias and swing by my new podcast, Fun Fun Fun, where I have great chats about all sorts of things I talk about on this channel with my other YouTube friends. I'm working on a really fun Wicked Witch one. If I can pull together, if I can pull together the Wicked Witch guest that I'm looking to get for the podcast, I'm gonna be so tickled. Oh, hey, patrons. It's my patrons. What's going on, patrons? It's so great to see you. Thanks for supporting all of my craziness here on the YouTube channel. Uh, and I love hanging out with you in the Discord and chatting with you and sharing all my stuff early on the patron website. Uh, swing on by, swing on by. Come, come see what it's all about. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, you rock. I have a munchkin outfit. I went with red lollipop guild munchkin. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> this is funny. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna have to revisit this.